It is 11 o'clock. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Uh, good for us to be here at uh, this day. Just a couple of quick notes as we uh, get on continue. Um, the uh, announcement about the uh, church actually supper is at the bottom of the uh, order service, so please take note of that, and it'll be good for us to support and come out uh, for that, uh, I'm sure it'll be a fun, yummy event. Another fun, yummy event is tomorrow uh, for our church breakfast. We're getting back into that for the first Monday of the month. Uh, so a few people have signed up already, which is great, but there's still time, so please feel free to sort of do that uh, after the service uh, when you, you, you get a chance. And uh, also, what, I guess one of the reasons why I'm feeling particularly chipper today is for three things. One, my wife told me she, she loved me this morning. <laughs> and then, and then Lolita said, "Good morning, sir." No, no. <laughs> Lots at the back of the church, it said, Lead Minister of God. <laughs> so I was sort of, so things, I don't know, things are just, I don't know. <laughs> uh, another thing that makes you feel pretty good is those fancy, fancy doors. So thank you. <laughs> and he, he can give me a key. Something to do with But you want to. Three, four, <laughs> five, five, five minutes? Uh, you don't get it. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go in the back door. Uh, we have our automatic door system hooked up, and uh, uh, we have a lot of direction sheets to put up on it yet. Uh, those of you who need a key for the front door, see Carol or myself uh, later on. There's, uh, you'll have to have a little class on how to operate this system. It's very simple. It sounds, when it's, you're explained to you, it sounds difficult, but it's not. It's very simple. Uh, it'll be a bad thing for short people because you have to get a switch. <laughs> so, uh, but when you come up the wheelchair ramp, there's a big aluminum thing uh, bolted to the wall. And you can kick the bottom of it, or punch the top of it, or hit the middle anywhere as you want. It'll automatically open the door for you. And the door will stay open for a period of time, like in case of a wheelchair or whatever. It'll give you lots of time to walk over and walk in the door. When you leave, if you need the automatic door, the button's over on the right-hand side. And you can hit that the same ID anywhere as you'd like. There's three different functions on this door. One is automatic, which will allow you to push the button and it'll open and close. One is uh, a hold, and if you put that switch on hold, it'll automatically open the door and it'll leave it open as long as you want it left open. But the thing with this system that we have is it has a safety thing on the motor so that it, if somebody goes out there and they're trying to push the button and the door doesn't open because it's still locked, uh, it'll automatically just kick the switch off and the door won't work it for that second, or it'll blow a fuse, and I'd rather not blow a fuse because you can take the cover off inside here to put a new fuse in. Uh, so there's a few things that you have to uh, remember to do with the system. Once you put it, if you're going to put it on automatic, which means that the buttons will work, is you have to push the inside panty bar in, and there's an Allen key, you have to tighten it in to keep the latch open. Any of you who get a key, all the key does is you turn the lock and you pull the door open. Take your key out. When you walk inside, it automatically lock behind you. Uh, and when you get ready to leave, you just push the bank bar and quote, and it close the door, close the lock behind you. So you don't have to relock the door. It's just a one, uh, it's just a one-way entry system with the key. Uh, if you're here by yourself, you probably don't even need to turn any of that stuff on. If you're expecting company, uh, you either have to, they'll either have to knock on the door and you'll have to let them in or you'll have to activate the system. But it's, it's quite a thing and anybody who needs, uh, who, who feels that they need a key for this door, uh, see Carol or I, uh, don't be in a rush because we're still waiting for uh, some pamphlets to put up and direction sheet to put on the wall and all that stuff so you know, you know, you can go and read it and then you'll know what to do.
Uh, your old keys still work on the choir door and the door downstairs. And the key, the key that you're going to get now is only going to work on one door, and that's this one. Uh, if there's any questions or we still have uh, quite a bit of repair work to do or, or finish work to do around the doors and stuff. Uh, we still got some repair work to do in the men's washing down there. We had the flood. Um, and the tile that's at their entry system here, uh, some of them have been broken out and uh, we're, we're going to see how much it's going to cost to tear them all out and put something new down if you've never matched what you have there. And they've been here since the church was built. So we'll look at changing those depending on the financing of, of how much it's going to cost to do this. Uh, so it's just a work in progress. Everybody's busy. It may be quite a while. So uh, uh, we've got to do crack on before we do finish work and all that stuff. So I've got uh, my younger brother's going to come down to the crack filling at his leisure, and then we'll get the rest of the stuff done. So if you have any questions, uh, call Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need a key, just see Carol or I. And, and I only I only uh, made a dozen keys, and uh, uh, I've given a few out to certain people that I like. <laughs> oh, you've got one, Michael. Didn't you? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, anybody, else, anybody else that requests a key for this door, uh, like a lot of people come in through the through the week and just sit here and reminisce and say your prayers. Well. If you want a key, then, then the key can be issued to you, and you just unlock the door and, and you leave it lock behind you. So, okay? Can you explain that again, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> it's only give me two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Perfect. All right. Any else we need to do or say that it's, it's almost quarter past? <laughs> <laughs> Then we are here, of course, uh, uh, gathered uh, in God's presence, uh, called by the Spirit who leads us into new things. So all of you are invited, so come, all of you of much faith, and you that a little, you have been here often, you are here for the first time. Those of you who have questions in your minds and doubts in your hearts, this is a place where all are welcome. This is a place where grace and love are offered to all. This is a place where we can be still and know the presence of God. So in that stillness, let's, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Gracious God and giver of all good things, in the beginning you raised us from the dust to the ground and guided us into a garden where you gave us everything that we would need. We were surrounded by beauty, we were embraced by your grace, we lived a life that was rooted, founded, and grounded in love. You breathed within us and breathed upon us the gift of your Holy Spirit, and our lives and hearts were filled with joy. We looked at one another then, and we were not ashamed. We looked at you, and we were home. But then there came that tragic day when all that was lost. We were deceived by the subtle voices that led us astray. We took something that didn't, did not belong to us. We betrayed your love, disobeyed your commandments. We sinned. And Father, we've been in trouble ever since. We've done those things that have hurt those we love. We've been angry and short tempered. We've grieved your Holy Spirit. And yet, you have never abandoned us. So in your great mercy, we ask that you forgive us all of this past. Those sins we call to mind are those things we are still too ashamed to mention. Help us to walk in the ways of your commandments, to be instruments of peace. Help us this day and all our days to walk in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. Tim this morning is the Servants of God, number 153. Mm -hmm.
and there is beauty and joy and wonder everywhere. And we thank you that we can come before you now and offer you these gifts. Give a loving hand and rest upon all that we offer you this day, so that through your goodness, these things can become even more abundant and used for the purposes of your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. continues as we sing him number 433, My Faith Puts Up to Thee, number 433. Ooh.
areas fortified by war and violence and poverty and greed. We pray for peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, and peace in the world. Continue to pray for peace for the people of the Ukraine. <coughs> Lord of life, your Son Jesus Christ was sent into the world in order that you may have life and have it in abundance. We pray for all those who are troubled, those in mental distress, those we know who are anxious, alone, or afraid. Continue to pray for Phyllis, for Annie, for Carol, for Dennis, and Dorothy, for Betty, and for Wayne, for Mike, for Judy, for Caitlin, for Louisa, for Sean, Nora, and Heidi. Put the eyes of your mercy upon all who call upon you this day. Stretch out your healing hand. Find out the broken hearted. Sustain the faith of the weary. Be a light for those who live with mortal. And in your great and powerful mercy, come alongside all those who walk in the valley in the shadow of death. And as you promised, grant your comfort to those who mourn. Till I die 
Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it is. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. God bless his word for us today. Amen. Come to the poor wife, then again, we for death. We'll have to be like this day. A strange story, I admit, but it is the one of the day, the one that Luke tells us Jesus is speaking with crowds. Now, a lot's happened since last week when Jesus left the home of Martha and Mary. My guess is that the domestic tension between the two sisters did get resolved, and by the morning, after a good night's sleep, the three of them enjoyed a quiet breakfast on the front deck overlooking the sun rising over the Sea of Galilee. All was good. But Jesus leaves that moment of family bliss, makes his way closer to the city of Jerusalem, drives out a few demons, preaches to the crowds, casually mentions this sin against the Holy Spirit, which will never, ever be forgiven, and then becomes embroiled in a more and more complex with the religious establishment. It is at this point that we come into the scene this morning. Jesus is speaking with the crowds. Many thousands of people have gathered to listen to his words, but this isn't some ordinary crowd. Luke tells us there are so many that the people begin trampling upon one another. In the very beginning of the story, it seems this is no peaceful gathering on the hillside of the Jordan Valley. This is a crowd that seems to be more and more agitated. They're pushing and shoving and shouting at one another. The tensions are mounting. Any sense of politeness or treating anyone with respect no longer exists in this crowd. And it is in this kind of tense atmosphere that someone interrupts Jesus and comes to him seeking some resolution for a family dispute. Two brothers arguing about an inheritance. There seems to be some misunderstanding about the manner in which these statements are divided. The quarrel reaches an end. So, one of them comes to Jesus and wants him to intervene. Teacher, he says, tell my brother, he says, to divide the inheritance with me. Last week, two sisters were arguing about who should do the dishes. This week, two brothers are arguing with the property left by their dead father. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I want what I'm owed. What's written in the will isn't fair. I've got a family to support too. How come he gets more than me? You can imagine, and perhaps have been part of, similar conversations. I've often said that funerals bring out the best and the worst in each of us. And this thing, yes, I know. And this seems to be leading toward what's the worst in some of us. Now Jesus listens to the request. But he refuses the request. He does not sit down and become the executor of the estate. He refuses not because he lacks legal expertise, but because he knows this dis disagreement is not about matters of the law, but as always, a matter of heart. That's where Jesus tries to redirect the conversation, but it's difficult. I remember when my two daughters growing up, the younger would just take her older sister's toys, and when the fight flared up, I became judge and arbitrator. When I asked what the problem was, the younger would tell me that, well, I'm just teaching my older sister how to share. 
<laughs> it was hard to convince her that taking somebody else's stuff, this is the point of, of sharing. Anyway, Jesus enters the conversation better than I did. And one of the first things he says is, beware. Beware of all greed, or other translations put it, beware of all covetousness. He then goes on to tell a parable for a farmer who's got a bumper crop and decides to build bigger barns. A good harvest could have been an opportunity for gratitude, but not this time. The farmer is obsessed with his possessions, as are the two brothers. They have allowed covetousness and greed, fear, and envy to get in the way of what otherwise presumably was a fairly loving or healthy relationship. Jesus tries to call these brothers back to place where they can forget their legal wrangling and make a good decision rooted in faithfulness, humility, and love. He wants them to return to the place of kindness, mindfulness, attentiveness, of, of quietly being aware and listening to one another. Jesus calls them on the mindset of winners and losers to that quieter place where Christ abides. Coveting cripples our ability to be faithful prevents us from a life of generosity, gratitude, and mutual respect. It's a distraction, but it's a very dangerous distraction. It's a desire that becomes out of control, which is why we so intimately collect things like greed and fear with that chronic sense of, I don't have enough. Coveting distorts the way you and I see each other. We end up looking at our neighbor as a means to an end, a way to get what we want. Coveting moves us to see people as things to be consumed and it's serious business. We use this word for greed or coveting only once. Matthew, surprisingly, tax collector, never uses it at all. But this word coveting comes up over and over again in Paul's list of sins, both in Colossians and Romans. Coveting even made it into the Ten Commandments. Number Matthew. But it's there. I know it's there. Prophets, of course, talk about it over and over and over again. It comes up in the scriptures a lot. So I think we need to pay attention to it a lot in our daily lives. Now, my guess is, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, that for the most part, we've kind of got coveting under control. Most of us are probably not coveting our neighbor's servants, donkeys, or oxen. Maybe we've got a new truck, a bigger pool, or house with more square footage. But most of us, by and large, are probably happy, content, and we look around and sort of satisfied with the stuff that we got. We don't want cash flow, we need to go along with us some problems and pay off that credit card, but we're not going to get too bent out of shape about it all the time. We're, we're kind of managing most things. But it's the coming of the other things that belong to our neighbor that I think it gets into trouble. You know, but, or recently I was coveting my opponent's back screen. Why can't I hit the tennis ball and keep it? Why can't my children be as well behaved as hers? Why can't they, my marriage be as happy as theirs? Why can't my, me, my wife be like theirs? They never seem to have any problem. Or, darn it, why can't I have a closer relationship with God like but you, we all want well to get children, happy marriages, and a closer relationship with God. It's good to desire those things, it's not a bad thing, but there are times when our desire gets tampered with, turns into something else, and the destroying of the us. The story of those first two humans in Genesis taught us that. In the garden, they looked to what they did not have rather than what they had been freely given. And they were deceived and tricked into thinking that. They were lied to, told the more is better, and life would be so much better with that, that, with that one thing they don't have yet. So they reached out to grab what didn't belong to them. They trespassed into some territory that they never should have been in. And you and I have been in trouble ever since. That insatiable dissatisfaction, quiet desperation, the seeds of discontent. There's nothing wrong with wanting more in our lives, but greedily glaring at our neighbor and wanting what they have is the path to death. 
I saw a publicist not too long ago. I stood in line at the bank and I noticed the way a man was looking at the woman standing at the bank machine. And I wanted to smack him on the back of the head and said, don't do that. Don't fall into that place. Don't put her in that place where you think you can take what you do not have. Then I got to the bank machine found myself having to take my own advice. I wasn't looking at her, but I was looking at the slip of paper that the machine spits up at the previous customer's bank balance. And I saw the balance of her checking accounts and I got down. <laughs> it happens to us all. We're called a state of rumor that life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And we're all called for that shift of allegiance. A new plumb line for our lives. Center our minds on earth and things. On things that are above. For it's death and all those things that creep in and kill us. So what do we do? Well, I don't know about you, but I just can't turn off coveting or those other things like jealousy, greed, envy, and fear. Those aren't character flaws exactly, but they're things that trip us up. Sometimes it's as simple as recognizing that there are times when I will be jealous, I will be envious, I will be greedy, and coveting will slither into my thoughts and be seen in my relationship with others. Sometimes coveting is there before I know it, like walking up to a bank machine. Sometimes, sometimes what we need to do is just have be quietly attentive to those things and a gentle acceptance that it's going to happen, but be ready, as Jesus says. Be ready. Be aware for when it does come. We have that gift of a discerning heart to be attentive to the ever-present voice of coming. We need to be gentle with ourselves and with each other when it comes in to those kinds of vices. We need to take them seriously and hold ourselves to account when I found that a firm yet graceful accountability goes a long way to heal the things of the heart. Covering and green. These are things, after all, that play each one of us. And finally, I found that the best response to coveting and greed is that practice of gratitude. Gratitude is a more, faith, more faithful way to live, living in a way that responds to God that leads to life. So I can pray, please God, I don't want to be coveting anymore. Or I can say, God, help me to be more grateful. Gratitude means that we look at what we have, not what we don't have. And maybe Jesus is right when he tells us this morning that our man's life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. It means that we look at everything as gift, and that's a possession. The problem with looking at things in our lives as possessions is we end up being possessed by the things we own, slaves to the stuff around us. Gratitude means a life of joy and contentment, life of quietness and Letting go, or like my Buddhist friends remind me, a life of just looking what it is, and all that what it is at the heart. It's not just counting blessings, but it's living out of our blessings, and seeing all of life is blessed. And behind everything there is beauty, wonder, and love. Those two brothers in Luke's Gospel don't see that. They're still clinging too much to what they think they deserve. The farmer in Luke's Gospel wants desperately to hang on to what he has, and in the end, he loses everything. May it not be so for you, or may it not be so for me. Maybe you once walked in those things, and maybe I also once lived in that way, but now, put them all away and put on the new nature, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. The thing that each one of you has been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. So life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life, a faithful life, a full life, consists in but one thing, richness toward God, fullness of joy, hearts that are overflowing with that joy that can never be taken away, walking in love that will never let us go, living in love, that always calls us home.
we want to adopt that, we will add to the other terms. So we'll see that I'm coming as we move to share with you. how the Lord Jesus calls us in the light of free from greed and fear, and we catch a glimpse of that light around this table, a table where all are welcome, a table of abundance, a table of generosity, a table of peace, a table where we break the bread and share and drink simple and sacred acts that the Lord Jesus calls us to do, and to gather with his friends together on the night before he dies. Before us there is the bread, the bread filled with hope, bread made from the grains of the field which fell in the earth and died, and yet now we see gives us life, and will be for us spiritual food. We have before us the cup, a cup filled with hope, a cup filled with the fruit of the vine, formed with human hands, crushed, but now as we see it gives us life, it will be for us spiritual drink. So let us pray. Father, on the night before your son Jesus Christ died, he gathered his friends in the upper room, giving us a new commandment that we should love one another. He showed us his love that he stooped to wash their feet, as he shared with them a meal of bread and wine, as he hung on a cross outside the walls of the city. We thank you that we can gather here in obedience to his command, that what we do, we do in remembrance of him. Help us never to forget the love that he showed, or turn away from the love that he offers us now. And we ask this in his name. Amen. You remember, you remember how the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Behold the body of Christ, broken for you, broken for me, broken for us all. And the deacons can lead us in prayer. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. 
let us praise him for the free gift he gave us in his dear son who gave his life for our freedom. Let us keep praising God every day for the freedom he has given us. Amen.
kingdom. Behold, the fruit of the vine is the cup of life and abundance. The fruit of the, the true vine gives life to the whole world. And we drink and never be thirsty, and we taste and see the Lord's food.